All right, hello class. Welcome to Dental Occlusion and Related Structure Lecture 1. All right. This is a D-Board exams um, class. All right. So we have, you have to review Dental Anatomy. Okay. Uh, if you have reviewed Dental Anatomy lectures, then uh, you can go ahead and proceed to this lecture. Okay. All right. So, you have to know dental anatomy um, and then you have to know occlusion how the teeth come together to achieve function and also the structures that in, uh, assists uh, the, the oral cavity and the teeth to achieve its function okay So the why is occlusion so a stable occlusion um, can be used okay it's necessary to have uh, gingival and PDL harmony okay if you don't have if you don't have uh, good occlusion what you end up having you have uh, problems such as uh, occlusal trauma you have attrition you have up, up fraction lesion but you can also have gingival recession okay as you can see in this image you have gingival recession here on this tooth okay and that's due to uh, inadequate inadequate or, uh, or, or malocclusion this is due to malocclusion so when you do have malocclusion and you're exerting force uh, on the on the tooth in a normal way and these forces are not uh are not parallel to the long axis of the tooth, so they are going to cause uh, some periodontal ligament loss, and you can have gingival recession. So this this patient underwent occlusal uh, adjustment, and you can see that after some time, the gingiva uh, regenerated back to to the normal uh, CEJ. Okay, so you have to keep in uh, that in mind when uh, you are considering occlusion and adjusting it. All right. So also you can uh, have uh, flemitus, okay? So what is flemitus? So flemitus is a functional mobility, okay? It's not just it's, it's not just mobility. It's functional mobility of teeth, and the tooth the tooth is mobile and has normal periodontal support when when it's flemitus. So this is not this is not periodontal disease because there's because there is no more periodontal support, so this is not periodontal disease. However, this is from occlusal trauma, okay? And to treat fremitus, which is functional mobility of the tooth, so when you have, uh, when, the, when the patient goes into occlusion, then you can feel the tooth moving. And the way you test fremitus is you, have, you can put your, 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 your finger on the on the labial surface of a tooth, or on the facial surface of a tooth, or the buccal surface, and then when the when the patient you ask the patient to bite down, if the, that tooth moves, it means that tooth has flemitus. Okay, so it's functional uh, mobility of the tooth. Again, the PDL is normal. All right, PDL is normal, and when you remove the interference, uh, you can reduce or stop the mobility okay all right the other the other thing that uh, can happen is that when you don't have a uh, occlusal uh, relationship or occlusal uh, harmony what you can have is you can have uh, posterior diastem diastemas so the space between teeth that can be created because of more occlusion okay so don't be surprised that diastemas Diastemas, we know that diastemas can be created by a, a labial frenum which is attaching very high up on the on the on the on the papilla, okay, especially in between uh, uh, teeth eight and nine. But diastemas can occur uh, anywhere uh, from due to uh, malocclusion, 
okay so you can appreciate here the space you can see the the, the, the diastema here in between here okay and when the occlusion was adjusted you can see that that space is closed okay so uh, that was because and also you appreciate that, that some of the gingiva is also starting to to come up all right so this is the reason why uh, occlusion occlusion uh, occlusal harmony has to be has to be achieved okay number one so that you don't have uh, fremitus number two so that you don't have diastemas number three you can have uh, efficiency uh, of the uh, mastication process and also you prevent any uh, myofascial dysfunction you prevent any tmj derangement okay so we're going to look at all those all right so sometimes also abnormal occlusion can cause um, uh, irreversible palpitis okay and that's that's just uh, uh, the 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 sensitivity of the tooth to cord okay and usually when you put the uh, air water syringe uh, on the tooth is going to bother the tooth and so you have to act, you have to make sure that you correct okay the the heavy occlusal contact on the on the tooth especially in the excursive uh, excurs, uh, excursive interferences okay so you have to test the patient both in a excursive uh, and protrusive motions okay and so when you adjust the occlusion the uh, the, the, the palpitis will go away all right so if you make it this is very significant especially if uh, you are i know i know this is for part one but you make sure you for part two especially now that the uh, part part two uh, i mean part one and part two are going to be combined so you have to keep all of this in mind that occlusion malocclusion can cause irreversible uh, reversible palpitis okay and if you're going to uh, prepare a crown okay and your occlusion is high or your feeling is high after doing a, a feeling then you may the patient may can come, come back with sensitivity that sensitivity is reversible palpitis um, and so you have to adjust the occlusion okay so what are the determinants of occlusion all right so these are you have uh, determinants of occlusion which include the right and left tmjs okay tmj uh, and then uh, you have the occlusion or the permanent dentition and then you have neuromuscular system okay so the fourth anatomical determinant of occlusion is neuromuscular system okay so you have to have when the teeth come together you can it sends signals to the brain okay and so that and then as um and then causes the muscles to contract or relax for example if you are chewing something soft and then you end up chewing like a stone you know if you're eating beans and uh, there's a stone in the beans which you didn't know and then you chew the beans guess what once you chew the bean the the, the, the stone sorry and then that 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 the the that signal is going to go from the tooth to the brain and then to the muscles and to cause the muscles to 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 relax and then you end up if, if it's the masseters the masseters are going to relax if and then uh, going to contract the 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 lateral trigoids and and will cause some opening okay so that's the neuromuscular system of anatomical determinants of occlusion so so make sure you know what what are the four anatomical determinants of occlusion okay so when you keep all this in uh in balance every time we, as we proceed from here now on keep keep this in mind that the, the four anatomical determinants of occlusion is the bilateral bilateral tmj joint okay so the bilateral tm 
joint and then um, the occlusal uh, determine uh, the, the the occlusal surfaces of the permanent teeth, and you have the the fourth one, which is the neuromuscular system. All right. So for the occlusion occlusion determinant, so you have to consider that the anterior teeth. All right. Uh, they 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 serve as uh, the active determinants and the posterior teeth are passive determinants and this is because we are going to see earlier this is because you have anterior guidance okay anterior guidance of the teeth and this is the anterior guidance is 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 when you have this occlusion okay this occlusion of posterior teeth when when the when the mandible is in protrusive or excursive movement okay that's the that's the anterior guidance you have canine rise okay which also protects the the posterior teeth so make sure you keep that in mind okay all right so let's look at the muscles of mastication okay so which of the following are muscles of mastication Number one, you have to know that the the, the, the masseter is a muscle of mastication. Okay, so you can't miss that one. The temporalis muscle is a muscle of mastication. The lateral pterygoid muscle and the medial pterygoid muscles. Okay. And the so if there is muscles of mastication, there's also muscles of facial expression now the 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 the, 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 the and the muscles of, as we're going to see the muscles of mastication are innervated meaning the nerve which supplies them is uh, trigeminal okay and the 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 the, the, the mus muscles of facial expression are innervated by the facial nerve and so the question is the the cheek you know when you're eating you have the cheek which is holding the food and everything else but the cheek uh, has a muscle which is called the vaccinator the vaccinator muscle so the, now what what the vaccinator muscle is is a, is a what is it a muscle of mastication or is it a muscle of facial expression so the vaccinator is a muscle of facial expression because it's innervated by the, the the facial nerve okay and it's used mostly for facial expression all right so muscles of mastication uh, muscles of mastication we have the temporalis muscle okay we have the lateral pterygoids okay so the lateral pterygoid has two heads the superior head as you can see, the fibers of the superior head are attaching to the cartilage here. All right, and the 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 fibers of the inferior belly, okay, or the lateral pterygoid muscle is attached to the to the uh, ter, uh, to the to the uh, to the fovea of the condyle condylar neck, okay. All right, and and so I have to point out the masseter. So you have the masseter here. Okay, so be familiar with this. Uh, with this, uh, this, this, this is from Nature's Nature's Anatomy. Okay, so make sure that uh, you 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 become familiar with this these muscles. All right. So again, just to recap, the muscle mastication is the masseter, the templaris, the lateral tegoid, and the medial tegoid muscles. And these are innervated by trigeminal nerve. All right, so we do have uh, a kinetic uh, chain muscles, okay? Meaning they the muscles that they they form a, a contraction chain causing movement, okay? 
so the the muscles of the head and neck they form a kinetic chain okay and uh, this kinetic chain involves the suprahyoid muscles okay and the infrahyoid muscles and posterior neck muscles and so when this kinetic chain they have to be the muscles have to be in harmony when there's a problem with one muscle uh, maybe it, it, so you, you, when there's a problem with one muscle, the entire function of the of the head or, or of the of the jaw may not be affected. It may be diminished, but it may not be completely uh, like uh, eliminated. Okay, because these are working in a group. But it may affect occlusion of the teeth. Okay, for example, if somebody uh, breaks the the condyle, okay. If somebody breaks the condyle, you know, the the lateral trigger muscle is attached to to that muscle. So because the rest of the mandible is not attached to that muscle, if the op the patient tries to open, because the, for example the condyle which is broken is on the right side, and the patient tries to open, the mandible is going to deviate to the to the right side because. The right lateral pterygoid muscle is not functioning, okay, because it currently has no attachment to the to the mandible. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind, and uh, know that muscles work in harmony with, with occlusion and mobility of the mandible. Okay, so and suprahyoid muscles. Uh, you can see the muscles which are above the hyoid, those are the suprahyoid muscles. Okay, and you have the anterior belly of digastric here. You have the mylohyoid muscle. Okay, and let's see which other one I can point out for you here, which is a, a suprahyoid muscle. And then you have um, the infrahyoid muscles, which in, in, in include the the, the thylohyoid, okay, uh, crico, uh, the, the uh, cricothyroid, the stenohyoid, okay, and the stenothyroid. So all these muscles here, excuse me, all these muscles here, the stenohyoid and the, st the stenothyroid muscles, those are uh, infrahyoid muscles, okay. And of course, when it comes to uh, anatomy, anatomic sciences, you have to know the triangles of the neck. Okay. All right. So the, as we mentioned earlier, there's active uh, determinants of occlusion, which is the anterior teeth. Okay. The anterior teeth are active determinants of occlusion. The posterior teeth are are passive determinants of occlusion okay the posterior teeth should act as closure stoppers okay meaning when you close or when you try to clench the only thing stopping the, the jaw is when the, the teeth are in occlusion so especially the molars okay so posterior teeth act as closure stoppers Ideally, the only excursive contact should be in the anterior teeth. So, when in excursive movement, so this is where it comes into mutual protection. Okay, mutually protected occlusion is when in 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 uh, retrusive movements or in in uh, in closing the, the posterior teeth. They, they protect the anterior teeth, okay, in closing such as clenching, you know. Um, so when you close with too much force, then the, the, the posterior teeth are going to act as closure stoppers and therefore protecting the anterior teeth. When you go into excursive movement, like you move your mandible to the lateral side, you go into protrusive, then the, there's going to be some anterior guidance, meaning the, the anterior teeth are going to to cause the, the posterior teeth 
to disocclude, to come out of occlusion, and therefore not touching. And that protects the posterior teeth. Okay? So, in excursive, in, in, a, in, a, in a excursive movements, the only contact you want to see is the anterior teeth. All right. Are you all following? I hope uh, if you, you know if if there's something um, uh, missing, this lecture is being recorded, so you you, you go back and review. Okay. Uh, so mutual mutually protected occlusion, which I just mentioned in the previous slide. So you have the posterior teeth um, that protects the anterior teeth in centric occlusion, and they help prevent excess loading to the TMJ. Okay. So the the posterior teeth act as closure stoppers okay and they prevent excessive loading on a tmj and then in protrusive movements the incisors pro uh, protect the canine and the posterior teeth in protrusive you have the the, the incisors protecting both the canines and the posterior teeth that's in protrusive movement okay because you have uh, that lamp, so you have you have the anterior, uh, the the mandibular incisors, which are slightly labial to the to the to the, to the maxillary incisors. So when when you open, you have that that the the, the mandibular incisors. Okay, when you go in protrusive movement, the mandibular incisors, they um, they slant down the labial. The labial surface of the of the of the maxillary incisors okay that's the mandibular incisors they slide down the labial surface of the maxillary incisors and therefore cause when they come to edge to edge contact and then they cause the posterior teeth and the canine to disocclude okay and during the lateral excursive uh, movements you have the canine that's the canine rise the canine they protect the incisors and the posterior teeth okay this is called mutually protected occlusion you see so three components you have you have in protrusive the anterior teeth anterior teeth are protecting the canine and posteriors and in in um, eccentric occlusion okay uh, eccentric occlusion or maximum intercarspation you have the posterior teeth Okay, protecting the anterior teeth and the TMJ. And when you have in, in the lateral excursive movements, I know most of you don't understand. Yeah, it makes it becomes difficult, but this makes it easy. So in the in the in the lateral excursive movements, you have the canine protecting both the anterior and the posterior teeth. Okay, when I say the anterior, meaning the incisors of teeth. Okay. So anterior guidance. Anterior guidance. For the past uh, few slides, I've mentioned anterior guidance. So what is anterior guidance? Hmm? You mentioned oh you have to have anterior guidance. I just mentioned it. Okay. So anterior guidance refers to the functional relationship of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth during excursive movement. Okay. Anterior teeth protect the posterior teeth through the posterior disocclusion and the effects of the anterior guidance are greater in premolar region so you have to keep in mind okay that the effects of the anterior guidance are greater in the premolar region and the effects of the condylar guidance are greater in the molar region okay so this is a very critical um, very important point to understand and the anterior guidance helps prevent an excuse, uh, 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 excessive uh, range of motion and this protects the TMJ by limiting uh, excursive movements okay understand I hope you understand uh, this principle a very uh, self-explanatory just make sure you understand uh, how the the teeth come together how the muscles of mastications work okay all right so 
condyla, uh, anterior guidance and condylar gui guidance. So the anterior guidance uh, should be equal to or greater than condylar guidance. All right. So condylar guidance and anterior guidance should be equal or the anterior guidance has to be greater than the condylar guidance. And this helps keep the condyles working against the posterior slope of the articular eminence during exclusive movement. If you distract the condyles, okay, from from the the from the the centric relation or exclusive interference, can be harmful to the temporomandibular joint. Okay, so if you make the anterior guidance very small. If smaller than condylar guidance, then you can have a very um, harmful forces on the, on the on the on the TMJ. All right. So anterior guidance uh, in the anterior guidance, the teeth are protected during associative movement, okay, by their distance from the TMJ, and the forces close to the joint are much greater. That makes sense, okay. So, if if somebody if somebody had to bite you, if say okay, put your finger in my mouth, let me bite you. Which area is 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 the more force going to be applied? Okay, on your finger, is it going to be applied here on the anterior, or is it going to be applied here? Now remember the joint that is opening and closing, and the muscles is right here. Okay, so this is the joint, and these are the muscles. Okay, the muscles which are closing this way. All right, so there's more. So, because the anterior teeth are far from the, the fulcrum, okay, this is the fulcrum or the pivot. All right, so where the muscle is attaching, that's the, 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 the fulcrum. And because it's far, so the less forces are going to apply to the to the anterior side, and more force is going to be applied in the molar side. Okay, so you have to know that here there's more more force, more force, and you have less force. Okay, due to the distance. So the greater the distance, the greater the distance from the the TMJ the lesser the force of occlusion. The closer the distance to the TMJ, the greater the, the force of occlusion. Okay? Keep that in mind. So this acts like a, a class 3. Okay? So the TMJ, TMJ acts like a class 3. Class three lever, okay. Uh, I'll put class three here. All right. So you have to keep in mind, and that's that's acts uh, as a purpose of uh, protecting the, the the teeth and also uh, making sure that uh, you don't have you don't have any uh, a TMJ uh, derangement. So protrusive movement. So you have uh, in protrusive movement you have uh, incisor edge position. Okay, as you can uh, appreciate here, you can see. So this is a uh, this is the mandible. You can see that in protrusive, the jaw has moved forward in this direction. So the jaw is moving this way. Okay. And so your incisors become edge to edge. So protrusive movement, the condyles, they slide down. Okay. They slide. First of all, it's sliding. It looks like it's sliding a little bit. So from the posterior. So if it, something moves from posterior to anterior, that means it moves forward. Okay. So it's moving forward. And downward. Okay, so in protrusive movement, the condyle 
slide forward and downward okay on the articular eminence on the on the posterior surface of articular eminence and the mandibular incisor edges are sliding downward the lingual surfaces of maxillary incisors so as you can see this is what i explaining earlier okay now here we have a picture here so you have this the mandibular incisors uh, surface they are sliding on the lingual surface of the maxillary incisors okay and become edge to edge and you can appreciate that this is mutually protected uh, occlusion because now you have the posterior teeth in protrusive the anterior teeth they are at the inside in protrusive the incisors become edge to edge and the occlusion in the molars disocclude become, goes up becomes apart and so the the molars are protected okay you have to keep that in mind now group function versus cuspid rise okay so number one so here in this picture you have a, a group function uh, group function okay group function is when 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 in excursive movement okay when 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 excursive movement for example in lateral excursive movement if you if you move your mandible to the to the left side okay then you have the teeth from the molars all the way to the incisors all of them touching on the side where the mandible moved on the working side so in this case the mandible is moving to the right side it's moving this way okay so this is a patient facing us so this is the right side this is the left side so the mandible moved to the right side so this is, means the working side is the right side but you can see that there's no cus cuspid rise right and there's no everything is touching from here so you can you can you can say that this is group function all right now look at the cuspid rise the second picture here okay so this is group function this is a cuspid rise so the cuspid rise when 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 you uh, your mandible goes into lateral excursion okay then you have the canines cast tips they come almost edge to edge right so you can see here you can appreciate there and now you have the posterior teeth okay on the working side they are not touching at all all right actually not also on the non-working side there's no there's not touching you can see that and so this is called cuspid rise and this is protecting in the cuspid rise both the posterior teeth so to know to know which teeth are protected during the certain movement is are the teeth the protected teeth are the teeth not touching so they are being protected because they're not touching so in cuspid rise the posterior teeth and the incisors they don't touch so, so that that means that those are the teeth which are protected in the in the protrusive the only teeth which are touching are the uh, anterior uh, the, the incisors okay and so the teeth which are not touching are the canines and the posterior teeth so in the protrusive the molars and the canines are protected by the by the incisor teeth in lateral excursions you have the you have the cuspid rise so the canines are touching so the only teeth which are not touching is the the molars and the incisors okay so ho hopefully that's a good review and you can rewind uh on the video we recorded so so you can you can 
you can uh, make sure that you understand the principles because fa fa uh, group function and caspi drives mutually protected anterior guidance all those those are those are game okay so you are, you are going to it's fair game on the exam okay so usually because of the anterior guidance okay uh, usually the this sometimes the anterior teeth are described as the the steering wheel of occlusion okay all right so which teeth are described as a steering wheel of occlusion is the anterior teeth all right so cuspid rise as i just explained uh, you can see very good cuspid rise in this picture all right and you can see a cuspid rise is when the the canines are touching edge to edge and the posterior teeth are not touching and the anterior teeth are not touching as you can see very clear picture all right so during uh during lateral excursion the canines are the only teeth to touch on the working side okay so on the working side is the side where the mandible moves to if the mandible moves to the right the working side is the right side if the mandible moves to the to the left the working side is the left side and the non-working side is the side which the mandible did not move to that's that's simple it, this this principle confuses a lot of people but it's very simple principle okay all right So still on the cuspid rise. So the cuspid rise is a true, it's considered a true friend of restorative dentist. Okay. Meaning if you establish a, uh, a, a cuspid rise, uh, it's going to help prevent working and balance interference. Okay. That's in number one. And so the canine eminence, the canine eminences are thick they are, they are because of the thick facial plate all right of the bone that provides additional protection from the forces on the canine so the canines have a big canine eminence that's that's just to make sure that they can support because during the the canine rise i mean the the cuspid rise the canines are the only teeth touching but remember touching means force on those teeth so they have to have very good stamina all right and that stamina is the the bone around the the the, 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 the roots of the canine which creates an eminence a canine eminence that that makes the canine able to support the force of occlusion when they the cuspid rise okay so that's the reason that's that's also the reason that the canines are, are called the the pillars of the mouth okay all right so this becomes fun now right, so everything comes together how function and uh structure and function are related okay and if you compromise one of them then you have you have uh, problems so canines also receive additional protection from the fact that they have the longest root in the mouth okay so all these factors they help the 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 the, the, the canines um, able to tolerate the forces of occlusion okay here yeah, during the cuspid rise all right so group function which we mentioned earlier you can appreciate in the picture here that the group function, if the mandible moves to the right side, all the teeth on that on that right side are going to be touching. That's group function. Okay. Now group function usually is it's seen in occlusal wear. Okay. In occlusal wear, you can see group function. Sometimes in if you're fabricating dentures, which is I like occlusion because you can use it for 
for part one and part two. But usually, if you're in the clinic, really, there's nothing like uh, National Board part one, part two. It's just you have a patient and you have to integrate all the knowledge that you know. So if I'm presenting this, this lecture, I know it's, if you are studying for your part one, it's going to be helpful. If you are studying for part two, it's going to be helpful. Now that everything is going to be integrated, okay, that's so the the integrated national boards is going to is going to emphasize more on the patient, okay, on managing the patient. It's it's not going to separate things like national board part one, part two. You have biochemistry here, you have physiology here. You just you have, the physiology is the patient. And the anatomy is the patient. The teeth are on the patient. So you're going to manage the patient. So you put all these principles together, structure, function, and aesthetics together, then you're able to treat and help the patient. So group function, for somebody to have to be in group function in with a natural uh, teeth, it means there has to be some occlusal wear. Okay? So in group function during a uh, lateral excursion, the buccal cusp, okay, the buccal cusps contact along the canines on the working side. So you can see that the buccal cusp, okay, the buccal cusp, they contact along the canines. So the buccal cusp contact on the working side. So all occlusal loads are shared by more than one tooth during lateral movement in group function. So in group function, remember in, in cuspid rise, only the canines are, are, are bearing the load, okay, the forces of occlusion. But in group function, everything is shared among the teeth because um, a lot of teeth are touching, okay? So all occlusal loads are shared by more than one tooth during lateral movement to prevent stress on a single tooth okay while at the same time stabilizing the mandible so a group function is uh, for example group function will be very good in a patient who has uh, for example very poor periodontal, periodontal uh, disease but which is being well managed okay and for example and you try to make him a prosthesis so that prosthesis, you, you can try to make it into a group function so that the forces are shared and not just um, isolated to one tooth. Okay, so very high are good principles here that you have to keep them in mind. All right, so uh, this picture shows group function. You can see that in group function, the 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 cusp the the buccal cusps okay i just mentioned this all right you have the outer inclines of the mandibular buccal cusps which contact the inner inclines of maxillary buccal cusp all right i have to say this again so in group function you have the outer incline outer inclines of mandibular buccal cusp contacting inner inclines so you have this is the outer okay all these here these are the outer all right and the inner inclines are the ones with blue. So th those are the inner inclines of maxillary buccal cusp. So again, the group function, you have the outer inclines of mandibular buccal cusp contacting the inner inclines of the maxillary buccal cusp. All right, so when a patient has group function, the restorative dentist may need to give special consideration to the condylar guidance. All right. So the use of protrusive and lateral records to set superior walls 
may not be adequate for setting condela guidance on the articulator. That's a dilemma, all right? Now, uh, condyla guidance. So, condyla guidance is uh, the functional relation of the hard and soft tissues of the TMJ. And this controls mandibular movements. Okay. So, condyla guidance is a functional relationship. Remember, relationships are important. Okay. In the jaws and in life. Right. So the, the condyla guidance all right, is a functional relationship of the hard and soft tissue of the TMJ, uh, which controls the mandibular movement. Now you have to remember that so well, this is so condyla guidance is 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 a is a relationship between the hard and soft. When it have, comes to the like what is CR? CR is a is a bone to bone relationship, contact relationship, right? So you have to keep all those in mind. All right. So here, some of the, the muscles involved in the condyla guidances. Okay. So um, you have the temporalis, of course, the, 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 the muscle, the altotegoids. So all the muscles of mastications. All right. And here, so in this, in this image here, you can appreciate here, this is a cadaver cut. You can, this is a external. External auditory meatus or ear canal, external ear canal, the auditory meatus, and this one is your. So who can guess the, what what this is? This is your cartilage. Okay, this is your your articulate disc. Okay, it's a fibrous, the articular disc we're going to see early, uh, later is formed by the uh, fibrous connective tissue, right? All right, and then who can guess what this is? Okay, this is the retromora pad. Okay, retromora pad, which has a lot of nerves and blood vessels. The articular disc itself does not have any nerves of blood vessels, so it is a vascular. Okay. And of course, here you can appreciate the condyle itself. All right. So this is the condyle. All right. And attached to this uh, articular disc, this here, this is the superior head of the lateral pterygoid, and this is the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid. And here you can appreciate the posterior slope of the articular eminence. Okay. All right. So make sure you're able to, 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 to label. Okay. The structure of the TMJ, uh, just by yourself, just when you're studying, make sure you, you, you label them because when you know how to label them, when a question comes at you, you already know the structure that is being talked about. And not just memorizing okay remember anatomy is not is not it's not uh, doctrine okay it's the anatomy you have to see the structure you have to know the actual structure okay and architecture of the structure to to memorize to to remember it okay? don't just memorize it okay you can always look at the structure or the pictures of the structure All right, so condyla guidance. So the condyla guidance says a very, very important uh, aspect. Okay, as we mentioned, so condyla, the condyla, condyla guidance depends on the slope of the articular, the posterior surface of the articular eminence. So you can see the the angles here. Okay, you can look at that slope there. Look at this slope, this is almost flat, and then look at this slope here, okay, 
which is very steep okay so this is like this so this is this is this is the steep very steep so if you have a very steep uh, posterior s slope of articular eminence the significance is that on your cast tip of occlusion the cast tip of the teeth are going to be tall you see that these cast tips are taller compared to this one this one here because this is almost flat so the articular eminence is almost flat so the cast tips of the cast tips of the molars are, are short. All right. So this is the beauty of structure and function and relationships, right? So this is how the conda. Now when you can say, "Oh, I'm working on the teeth. I'm not a TMG specialist." Okay, you're not, but you're affecting. You are, you, when you affect the two surface, you can affect the the, the TMJ. Just remember that, okay? If you change the, the cast height, you're going to affect the, the, the condyla guidance because it's all related, right? So the flatter the articular eminence, the shorter the cusp must be. And then the steeper the articular eminence, the taller the cusp must be, okay? That's very important, important principle. All right. All right. So working and non-working size, we've already mentioned this earlier. So this is mostly like a revision for you guys. Um, so during a right lateral excursion, you have the right side in the working and the left side in the non-working or balancing side. So non-working is called balancing. If you are not working, it's like, okay, how are you balancing? You know, somebody will ask, Okay, you're not working. Okay, so you're not working. So how, how are you balancing, you know, your daily, your day-to-day -day activities without working, right? So you're balancing, you're hanging on, right? So you can, you can, uh, you can always, uh, you know, apply all those. So learning by association. If you learn association, why is this called, you know, balancing side? Okay, and non-working is called balancing side. Yes. So that's you have to know that. When you say balancing and non-working, it's all the same thing, all right? So this side, so this is the right side. This is the left side because this is the patient looking at us. We are looking into the patient. So the patient moved the jaw to which side? Okay, give you time to answer and think a little bit. So the here, the, the, the mandible moved to the right side to this side okay so if the mind will move to, to the right side it means the working side is the right side because that's where the mind will move and you have a nice caspid rise do you see that between the teeth number six and 27 and now you can appreciate that in during the canine uh, the cuspid rise you don't have any posterior and anterior occlusion right so the teeth here and the teeth in the back here are not touching that's a cuspid rise that's work right working movement all right moving on so the working interferences Working interferences can occur between the inner inclines of non-supporting cusps and the outer inclines of supporting cusps. Okay. So let's let's look at uh, a teeth here. So let's say this is a, a maxillary tooth. This is a, a mandibular tooth here. Okay. This is a rough estimate, okay, of the teeth. So, the top one is the maxillary tooth, and the the bottom one is the mandibular tooth. So, now the question is, which one is non-supporting cusps? Non-supporting cusps are 
in the maxilla in the maxilla are going to be the buccal cusps right they are called non-supporting because okay they are not they're not occluding into the into the the central grooves or the 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 the, the the mesial or distal fossa or the marginal ridges so th those are the support so the, those are the non-supporting cusps the supporting cusps on the maxilla they are the palatal cusps okay or the lingual cusps and then in the mandible the supporting cusps are the the buccal so it says the working interferences is between inner incline of the non-supporting inner incline of the non-supporting okay and the outer incline of the supporting now we say that this is non-supporting in the maxilla that's the buccal so this is the buccal this is lingo buccal lingo so this cusp here okay is non supporting non supporting cusp are also called what shearing cusp okay and uh and uh supporting cusp are also called what functional cusp what's the other name for functional cusp stump cusps okay so the this is non supporting and this cusp here okay this is supporting cusp because that's the mandible right you support so the inner so the so the, so the inner incline of non-supporting cusp so it's going to be the this inner surface here okay for example the mandible if the mandible moves to the to the right that means it's moving this way okay considering this is the patient mouth so we're looking at the patient mouth so this is the right side so it's going to be moving to this side so that's the working side so this inner incline of non-supporting cusp is going to interfere with if you have any interferences it's going to interfere with the outer you see that this is the outside so this is this cusp here is incline this is the outer incline of the supporting cusp so okay so here i'm gonna shed so you can see them here really well so that's working interference if you have them okay they are going to occur in the uh, inner inclines of non-supporting and then the outer inclines of supporting all right so uh cross tooth balancing interferences so the close tooth balancing interferences is actually occur on the working side and it is a working interference it involves the outer incline of the maxillary lingo all right it involves the outer incline of maxillary lingo uh, cusp and the inner incline of the mandibular lingo cusp okay uh, you may be asked this but this is not very common all right but just know that uh, there is a cross tooth balancing interference all right so balancing interferences or non-working interferences okay they occur between the inner incline of maxillary lingual cusp and the inner incline of the mandibular buccal cusp and both cusps are supporting cusps. So balancing, balancing interferences or non-working interferences, they occur between the inner incline of maxillary lingo cusp and the inner incline of the mandibular buccal cusp. So the most important thing is that you have to know for non-working interferences to occur, they are all occurring on the supporting cusps, inner inclines. 
the inner inclines of supporting cusps and supporting cusps on the in the mandible are the buccal cusp the supporting cusp in the maxilla are the palatal or if you want to say lingual cusps okay all right so keep that in mind I know during the exams they used to give the images okay this is balancing interferences this is working and working but now instead of giving you giving you a picture they say okay what 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 side of the manual what kind of interference is this now they give you a description so you have to know the occlusion really well you have to know which teeth occlude where you have to know the in the in the balancing interferences what inclines are involved? The, the, the inner inclines of supporting cusps. Okay. In the in the working interferences, you have to know, okay, well, where, where are the, the, the working interferences? You have to know that they are in the inner inclines of the maxillary and the outer inclines of the back, uh, the mandibular buccal cusp. Okay. So those principles you have to apply them on a description which you may be given will, will be given in your exam okay if they give you a picture it will be easy great but if they give you a description then you have to form a picture in your mind some people may draw okay just to capture what they, what's being described but you have to make sure that you know the principles of occlusion and interferences okay both balancing and 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 working interferences uh, for you to answer these questions. They are easy questions, but you have to know the principles. All right? And this lecture is going to help you uh, get there. All right? So, working position. So, working position, uh, the non-supporting cusps accommodate working movement. Here, in the exams, uh, you're going to be given a description, okay? So you just have to make sure that you know in the working position where the, the non-supporting cusps are. So in the working position, the medial distal position of the non-supporting cusps accommodates the working movements, all right? That's in the working movement. And the cusps, okay? Are aligned with the opposing embrasures and developmental grooves in the working position. So, in the working position, where are the cusps located? Okay, so the the cusps are aligned with the opposing embrasures and developmental grooves. Okay. All right, just dropped my pen. Need to pick it up here. All right. All right, so let's continue. We are halfway in this lecture. All right, so the now you have to, to talk about the orbiting. Orbiting and rotating condors, okay? Very important uh, to understand. It's very easy. Now, remember, the principles are easy. You just have to put in time to remember it. Once you get it, it won't go away. You, you when you get it you, when you get it you get it when you understand it you understand it okay if you don't understand it you can get it but you have to make sure that uh, you 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 keep on uh, reviewing the lecture okay uh, so the so in 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 lateral mandibular movement okay on the on the on the condor so the lateral mandibular movement, the condor on the side towards which the mandible moves. So the, in a, on in the working movement, okay, that's called the rotating condor. All right. So if my mandible moves to the right side, it means the rotating condor is the right side if my mandible moves to the left side for example in the picture uh, this one here in the picture the, the patient is moving to the right side so this means okay 
the right corner so this is right this is left so the right side is the rotating condor rotating so rotating just just is how can you remember so if you are rotating it means you are working okay if you if you if you if if you if the if the tires or the wheels of your car are rotating it means your car is running it's working right all right so you can get it's, i like to 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 learn by association so if you associate something you you don't you don't forget so rotating something is rotating it's working all right the same with the conda a, a rotating conda is a working conda meaning is the side where the money ball move to the orbiting conda okay is the conda uh, on the non working side orbiting okay so it's like uh, you can say orbiting somebody is not is not really uh working okay you're just orbiting you're just passing by you're not working you're orbiting the environment you're orbiting the office just walking by you're not you're not working okay all right so you have to keep that in mind so it's very important so the uh, as i mentioned the the in the picture here so you have the con down the on the side opposite uh where the mind will move to is called the orbiting conda and in the lateral maneuver movements the orbiting conda moves so the orbiting conda moves inward all right inward orbiting conda moves inward And then it moves downward. And then it moves forward. Okay. And it orbits about the rotating conda. And so when when the when the when the orbiting conda is moving inward, downward and forward forward guess what the rotating conda is doing the rotating conda is moving outward outward okay and then it moves it's moving outward during the 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 the, 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 the movement okay so rotating conda moves outward while the orbiting conda is moving inward downward and forward okay so make sure you keep that in mind it's a, it's a, it's a, most of the questions they, they like to ask that they may ask in a different way okay and uh, just make sure you, you understand the principles okay so the orbiting path uh, is the the path of movement of the con uh, of the orbiting conda and the rotating path is the path of movement of the rotating conda. Protrusive path is a path of movement of the conda in straight protrusive movement. So you can understand all those movements. It's very clear, very easy to understand. You just have to understand. It's just the terms, okay? But if you associate the terms with something you already know, it makes sense. Rotating means working. Orbiting is the non-working side. All right. All right. So the orbiting conda. So the orbiting conda moves uh, downward, forward, and medially. That's what we just mentioned. So instead of medially, there's inward. Okay, inward. And the orbiting conda is the conda on the non-working or the balancing side. All right. We're not going to waste time on that. Well, they explained. And the rotating conda is that, so the, the rotating conda moves laterally. So it may, it moves laterally, meaning it moves outward. All right. Now it may also move forward. 
or backward or it can move upward or downward but essentially it moves laterally or outward okay the rotating conda is the conda on the working side as we as you already know all right the cable speed we've discussed the cable speed in the in the uh, on the dental anatomy lectures okay they're about uh, six or seven lectures make sure you review that the cave of p as i mentioned is very important to understand the cave of wilson is also very important to understand um so the the cave of p is the just a quick review there's a curvature which begins at the canines and follows the bulkers tips of the premolars and molars a flatter cave of p is less likely to have excursive interference okay you understand that a flat cable speed is less likely to have excursive interferences because everything's flat so everything's on the same level so there's no interferences okay the curve of wilson so the curve of wilson is uh, is the is the a, 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 a horizontal or a transverse is a transverse uh, uh, path okay or curvature it's a medial lateral uh, that's another way of saying uh, transverse transverse so it's a medial lateral curvature of the occlusal plane of the posterior teeth okay and <clears throat> so here uh, there's some principles which you have to understand these principles i have mentioned in the previous lectures all right and i'm going to review the, them here again so the curve of wilson depresses non-supporting cusps and helps them uh, prevent working interferences okay so the curve of wilson depresses the non-supporting cusps okay meaning the anchor supporting cusps on the on the on the on the maxilla is the the buckle right in the mandible is the lingo okay so you can see that the the non-supporting cusp is always a little bit lower okay it's like it's if, if you if you draw a line a straight line right on the occlusal surface here so this one here you can see that the the lingual cast is almost a little bit lower than the the buckle cast and the same here the if you draw a line a tangent line on the cast tip of the or the here you can see that the the the, the buckle or the buckle cusp is a little bit higher or lower or you know epical let's let's use epical epical is 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 much better description so you can you can see that the non-supporting cusps the non according to the curve of speed the non-supporting cusps are located epical to the supporting cusps and this is to prevent okay uh working interferences so the curve of Wilson, did I just mention the curve of speed? And not the curve of, so according to the curve of Wilson, the curve of, so the, 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 the non-supporting cusps are depressed to prevent the working interferences. Now, the principle that I, I want to review here again is that due to the curve of Wilson, the crowns of maxillary teeth okay they incline they incline they lean to the buckle and the roots lean to the lingo okay then in this direction and according to the cave of wilson the roots the roots of the of the mandibular teeth 
they incline to the buckle while the crowns incline to the lingo, right? That's a principle. That principle is to help protect the cheeks. Okay? It helps protect the soft tissues. On the buccal side, it's going to help protect the, the labial mucosa, the cheek, so that you don't bite yourself. That's why when you have some uh, cross bite, you, you have frequent cheek bites. And also, it, on the tongue side, it's going to prevent the tongue from being caught on the teeth when you are chewing. Can you imagine? Something that you may have not realized, but you can close your mouth real fast, quickly, without biting your tongue. Sometimes you, you bite your tongue, but that's that's just when you probably you are eating something and you bite in the wrong way. But most of the time, you can put your teeth back together without biting your tongue. That's because of the Cape of Wilson, okay? All right, so the compensating occlusal, occlusal curvature. So now when you put the Kevo P and the Kevo Wilson together, this is a review because we've mentioned before. So the so here's a review for you guys. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but uh, this is very important. The compensating occlusal curvature is a, a combination of the Kevo P and the Kevo Wilson. It, uh, and... It is also known as the sphere of monsoon. Okay. Bennett movement. Bennett movement. So we have. So the Bennett movement has two components. Okay. You have the first component, which is called the immediate side shift. And then you have the second component, which is called the progressive side shift. The immediate side shift is the initial lateral side shift of the mandible during lateral excursion. So if you move your, your mandible, so you try to say, put, put your teeth together and uh, move, your, move your mandible to the, to the right side. If you start moving, okay, that's your immediate side shift. Okay, immediate side shift. And then you have the progressive side shift, uh, which is which corresponds to the downward and forward and medial movement of the orbiting condor. Okay, so the 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 immediate side shift is no longer considered as important clinically. Okay, and the progressive side shift corresponds to the downward, forward, and medial movement of the orbiting condor, right? So, you have, just have to keep those in mind. All right. So, the on the, the, the Bennett angle, usually the Bennett angle on the, the semi-adjusted articulators, and those articulators are class, class, class 3, okay? Semi-adjusted uh, articulators. And so for the semi-adjusted articulators, usually they, they have prob they have they're not they work like a conda, okay, but the upper member is the one which moves, you know. So it, the upper member of the the semi-adjustable uh, articulators it acts as like like a, a mandible because that's the one moving, okay. And the lower mandible, the the lower, <laughs> sorry. The lower, the lower jaw, the lower uh, member of the semi-adjustable uh, semi uh, articulator acts like, like a maxilla because it doesn't move. That's a fixed. Okay. And then, so you have to keep that in mind that uh, it's a little bit, even though the, the articulators help us, but, you know, the, the in terms of movement and functionality, uh, the parts that uh, the, the upper part moves like a, a mandible, okay? So, the Bennett angle corresponds to the angulation of the medial wall. That's the Bennett angle, okay? Because remember, the Bennett movement, 
the, pro, the, the, the progressive size shift corresponds to the, the movement of the orbiting corner. And the orbiting corner, remember, it moves inward, meaning medially downward and forward, right? So if it moves medially, it means it's moving medially, so it's moving against along the medial wall. So everything is going to depend on the angulation of the medial wall. Okay, the superior wall will have been set to a lateral or protrusive uh, check bite, okay, or pant uh, pantography, uh, pantographic tracing. So, uh, when you're setting your articulator, you have to adjust it, make sure that uh, your angulation is in the right uh, place, and also sometimes you have to put the 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 guiding table. All right. The average setting is usually 15 degrees uh, may be used clinically. All right, for bended movement. So the bended movement, the corner on the working side has a lateral side shift, which is true because it's a rotating corner, right? Or it may have translation during the earlier stage of the lateral movement right so which is which which is what i said so the better movement occurs on the working side and is the early lateral side shift of the of the mandible is also referred to as the immediate side shift so immediate side shift is called okay it's called the 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 early lateral side shift and that's on the rotating corner that's the the working side all right all right so the bent angle is found on non-working side the orbiting side so when you see bennett bennett think about balancing so balancing b for b bennett balancing balancing bennett is a non-working side right so that's the non-working side that's the orbiting corner so all right so the the bennett angle is found on the non-working side that's the orbiting side that's why i put a star on this one the bend the bend angle is on the non-working orbiting side and refers to the to the path of the corner in a horizontal plane which is the reason it's along the media wall. It is also referred to as a progressive side shift. Okay. All right. Any questions here? Make sure that uh, you go back and review. Lateral and progressive records. Okay, so lateral and progressive uh, lateral and progressive records. So the lateral records are used to set angulation of the superior walls of the fossa for lateral excursion. So this is your articulator. So the why are we discussing articulators? You're going to be using articulators, uh, especially if you're trying to triangulate the maxilla to the to the to the to the to the, to the cranial base. Okay. That's when you use the first ball. All right. So and and then later on you're going to to mount uh, the, the 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 models. So you have to make sure that uh, the your your articulator is well adjusted. And the protrusive record. Okay. So when the patient comes in, you're going you're taking impressions to to make a complete denture. You also will take a protrusive record. Okay. And these are used to set. The angulation of the superior walls of the fossa for protrusive movement. Okay, what's the purpose of, of uh, protrusive record? Is to set the angulation of the superior walls. All right, and that remember why you setting angulation of superior walls and all these. Remember all these, uh, as we mentioned, if if you have a, a, a very steep. Uh, Eminence, okay. Uh, the eminence of the glenoid fossa, then you're going to 
to have uh, tall cusps. If you have very uh, flat eminence, then you are going to have short cusps. So you have to keep that in mind because make sure you have uh, a good record and, and make sure you can duplicate that for the patient. So orbiting pathway, as we mentioned, so the orbiting pathway is steeper than the protrusive pathway. Okay, this helps prevent balancing interferences. So why is the orbiting pathway steeper than the protrusive pathway? Here is the answer for you. A protrusive bite may be used to set the condylar inclination. So here's another question. Okay. The protrusive bias may be used to set a condylar inclination on both diagnostic models and working models. This is what I just told you. All right. And the protrusive or orbiting path, when you have the protrusive pathway, is usually flatter than the orbiting path. We just say that the orbiting path is, is steeper, right? If the patient has cuspid rise, then the setting for superior walls that were obtained from the protrusive record can be used for all excursive movement. The patient's posterior teeth will actually disocclude faster than on the working model, and chair time will be saved when sitting a cast restoration. Okay? So all these things, why you capture the, the, the protrusive record, the lateral records, all this is to duplicate the, the patient uh, uh, function without interference, okay, in the, in the, in the occlusal uh, heart tissue and soft tissue relationships. All right, so centric occlusion. Um, centric occlusion is also called uh, maximum intercuspation. Okay, that's mistakenly called, uh, referred to mass, mass, uh, maximum intercuspation. So instead of centric occlusion, just say maximum intercuspation. Okay, all right. Um, so the centric stops. The centric stops you're supposed to know uh, by now you should know uh, you know where each tooth occludes okay now each dot corresponds to where the the teeth occlude okay so these teeth here are mandibular teeth this this teeth here on top are maxillary teeth so you can see you can appreciate that the no, now starting from the anterior portion, so you can see that tooth number. So here you you can you can actually know that this is tooth number. This is this is the left side. So this is going to be tooth number twenty one. So you can see that the, the the first premolar, the first premolar, the 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 supporting cusp on the back or on, on the man, mandible is the is the buccal cusp so the buccal cusp of the first premolar is going to occlude on the marginal ridge of the maxillary first premolar and the supporting cusp on the maxillary is the the lingual so the lingual cusp is going to occlude on the distal marginal ridge or the mandibular first molar okay and then so on and so forth so make sure that you remember this cusp as long as you know okay where the the the, the supporting cusp is and which tooth is uh, it's, it's occluding with then you know the buccal cusps in the mandible are most likely going to occlude either on the marginal ridge or in the central fossa Okay. All right. So there is so occlusion centric stops. You can have two forms. You have you have uh, 
cusp to marginal ridge, you have cusp to fossa, and cusp to occlusal embrasure. Centric occlusion, so the this is the back of you, okay? So you can know that the maxillary buccal cusp are in line with the opposing buccal embrasures and developmental growth. So you can see buccal embrasures here, this is an embrasure, and you can see that the maxillary buccal, buccal cusp are in line with that. Or this is in line with the growth, okay? So this is this is what you call angle class one, right? So angle class one, the, the class one angle is is when the 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 maxillary the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar is in line with the the mesial buccal growth of the mandibular first molar. Okay, so these principles of occlusion you have to understand it. Okay, the previous slide, this slide, and the subsequent slides. So. Uh, the molar relationship back of view. So this is the the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar opposes the mesial buccal growth of the mandibular first molar. This is angle class one, all right, as I just mentioned, and the distal buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar opposes the distal buccal growth of the mandibular first molar. You see that. So this cusp is opposing this groove. This distal buccal cusp of the maxillary is opposing the distal buccal growth. Okay, remember the mandibular first molar has five cusps and it has five lobes. Which other two has five uh, may have five lobes? That's the the white type mandibular second molar uh, premolar. Okay, those are the those are very good questions. So. Um, the, the current exams uh, gives you like definition, which tooth does this, this, okay? But this one, this now the, 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 the new uh, exam is going to consist of the patient comes in and you're looking at this, okay, what kind of morphology do you expect on this tooth, okay? All right, so it's, it's more patient-oriented and what you're looking for, all right? All right, so the mesial buccal cusp, okay, of maxillary second molars, they oppose the buccal groove of the mandibular second molars. Just make sure you keep that in mind, okay? You review and memorize it. They're very easy. Just look at it, memorize it, do more, more, more questions, practice questions, which are also available. Okay, so ev everything is available. Make sure just you, you go to it. You know, you review the the lectures. You re listen to the lectures, listen to them again, and then you practice, and then practice some more. Make sure that uh, you understand. Because, I mean, how how would you call yourself a dentist if you don't know? If you know all the physiology. Okay, you don't know the physiology, but you don't know, um, you know about about teeth. Let's let's just say that. Okay. As a as a dentist, the tooth shall set you free. All right. Okay, let's move on. So the centric occlusion. The lingual view. So in the lingual view, central occlusion, the, 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 the mandibular lingual cusp are in line with the opposing lingual embrasure and developmental growth. So these questions usually they come in in a description. They don't give you right that way. You just have to make sure that you remember that uh, the in the lingual view, the mandibular lingual cusp are in line with lingo embrasures and the developmental groups 
and um, in the lingual view you have the mesial lingual cast of the mandibular molar opposed the lingual embrasures and the distal lingual cast of the mandibular molars oppose the lingual developmental growths in the maxillary arch which you can see in the picture there so working side <clears throat> on the working side the mesial lingual cusp of the maxillary molars they track out through the lingual growth of mandibular molars okay let me give you a description okay you're restoring this tooth da 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 and uh, you establish the working side, you ask the patient to move to the, for example, you ask the patient to move to the left. Okay. Uh, where will the mesiolingual cast of maxillary molars track? Okay. So they will track out the lingual groove of the mandibular molars. Okay. That's those, those are the type questioning. And so, but it may be incorporated on the, onto a specific patient. Or situation so on the working side the distal buccal cusp okay in the working side so the working side you have to make sure that so in the working side first of all we're going to have a lecture on this but make sure that you know that to identify so they no longer give pictures uh, this kind of pictures they may give uh, more pictures because now they they, they are coming integrated it's going to have some pictures in there, okay? Um, so, if they give you a, this kind of picture, you have to understand, okay, what 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 arch is this? Is this maxillary or mandible? And so we know you have a cuspal color belly here, so that you know it's a mandible. Now, is this the, I mean, you know it's a maxilla. Now, is it the, the right side of the maxilla or the left side, the, the left side of the maxilla? So, you, through your dental anatomy if you in your mind you flip the the occlusal surface to first uh, downward then you know this is going to be the right side so it if the arrow is on the maxilla it means the 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 the, the arrow was drawn by the direction of the mandible so if it's the arrow is the maxilla you don't change the arrow if the arrow is the mandible then it means the movement was opposite to the arrow. Okay. So, in this case, the arrow is on the maxilla. And this is the right side of the maxilla. So, the, the man will move to the right side. So, and the arrow is pointing to the, to the non-working cast, to the non-supporting cast. So, this is a working movement. All right. So the distal buccal cast for the mandibular molars they track out the buccal groove of the maxillary molars. In the non-working side, so on the non-working side or balancing side, the mesial lingual cast, okay, or the maxillary first molars they track out the distal buccal groove of the mandibular first molar, and the cast tracks the distal buccal direction. Okay. All right. So for supporting cars, so in the uh, in the maxillary arch, the supporting cars are the lingual cars, as we know, or the palatal cars, and the, in the mandibular arch, the supporting cars are the buccal cars, and the supporting cars they contact the opposing centric stops and do most of the grinding during mastication so the supporting cast do most of the grinding during mastication and they are the ones which contact the opposing centric stops non supporting cast are uh, in the maxillary they are the buccal cast in the mandible they are the lingual cast okay 
so here the the non cast supporting cusp are the buccal cusp in the maxilla and the non supporting cusp in the mandible are the lingual cusp the the and then the so the cusps okay the non supporting cusps uh, overlap they overlap the supporting cusps in centric occlusion there is about half a millimeter to one millimeter space okay between the supporting and non-supporting cusps that's 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 in in, in centric occlusion so protection of soft tissue as i mentioned earlier all right you have the 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 the, the position of non-supporting cusps they, they protect the soft tissue okay maxillary buccal cusp overlap the opposing mandibular buccal cusp and the mandibular the, the mandibular lingual cusp they overlap the opposing maxillary lingual cusp maxillary buccal overlap mandibular buccal mandibular lingual overlap the maxillary lingual okay so the non-working cusp they overlap the working cusp because the working cusp are coming in with force so to to protect the soft tissue from the non-working i mean i mean from uh, to protect the soft tissue from the forces of the working cusp the non-working are going to overlap the working cusp okay that's the principle so the Make sure I understand this protects the soft tissues. All right, so protection of the soft tissue, as I mentioned, so the maxillary uh, buccal cast, they help keep the cheek out of the way during mastication, as I mentioned earlier, and the mandible lingual cast, they help to keep the tongue out of the way during mastication. So, interdigitation meaning how the teeth come together. As a general rule, each tooth interdigitate with. Okay, so here I have to emphasize that this is a critical principle in us you, for your understanding of occlusion. All right. So, as a general rule, each tooth interdigitates meaning occludes with two opposing teeth. Each teeth at uh, uh, close with two opposing teeth. It helps provide stability for the dental arch. So interdigitation is most distinct in the anterior and premolar region, and it is less distinct in the molar region. Okay. So, for interdigitation, a mandibular tooth interdigitates. So, a mandibular tooth occludes with the same tooth in the maxilla and the tooth mesial to it and the tooth in front of it. So, for example, if tooth number 21, okay, what is it going to occlude with? So the tooth number twenty one is a is a is a mandibular it's a left mandibular first premolar. So it, it means it's going to occlude with the maxillary left first pre, uh, first premolar, which is tooth number twelve. So tooth number twenty one is going to occlude with tooth number twelve. And and then it's it's going to occlude with the tooth in front of tooth number 12 so that will be tooth number 11 so that's going to be the canine right so you make sure you you play with that and uh, make sure you understand this principle that's why i stopped to explain so a maxillary tooth interdigitates with the same tooth in the mandibular arch and the tooth distal to it exceptions always when you see exceptions make sure you know okay so exceptions are the mandibular central incisors, 
and the maxillary third molars, which interdigitate with only one opposing tooth. Okay, so make sure you understand this is the end of our lecture. This is very uh, good that we ended here so you understand the occlusion and the principles. Okay, make sure you go back, review. You can pause, take breaks, and come back and uh, continue. Okay, if you have any questions, again, feel free to message me or email. Um, And I'll be happy to help answer your questions. All right. So we'll see you in the next class.